Hey, Lost City. Um, due to technical difficulties in last Sunday's service, um, and because audio was not clear, and the fact that we're doing these core values, really wanting to communicate who we are as a church, we decided to re-record the sermon so that you can um, watch and hear and understand where we are as a church and where God is taking us. And so over the last several weeks, we have looked at the core values that we are implementing here at Lost City, the new core values that we have put into place. And like I've said the uh, first few weeks, there are specific values our leadership team um, recognized to be true of our church. And we felt that these are the things that we want our church to be known for. At the end of the day, when someone talks about Lost City, our prayer is that these core values would be reflected in what they see in our church community. We took our list of 20, 30 some things that were listed in our leadership team and narrowed it down to four simple core values. The first core value, the one on which everything else is built on, the most important core value is that we are Christ-centered. Everything else stems from that. The second core value is that we are a diverse family, that God um, has blessed us to be incredibly diverse. And our church is incredibly diverse, more than just ethnic diversity. There are diversity in gifts and talents and callings in our church community. The diversity comes with its challenges, but when it's lived out well, it is a beautiful picture of what heaven one day is going to look like. Last week, we looked at the core value of what it means to be radically generous. We're a church that's called to be a blessing in our community and our world, and but that generosity must overflow out of the transformation of the gospel in our lives. And today, what I want to do in um, some brief time together is look at our last core value, mission-driven. What does it mean for us to be mission-driven? This is what makes us a church. Jesus was sent onto the earth to um, with a mission from the Father, and then he births the church, and he gives the church a mission. And without this, we exist to fa we fail to exist as a church. And as I've done in the previous three sermons, let me share what we have written up as leadership when it comes to what we believe about being mission-driven. This should be on the screen in front of you, but here's what we've said. We said, we believe the church has been given one mission, to make disciples of all nations. This means that we are called out as missionaries, inviting people to be followers of Jesus wherever we are. Each of us have a sphere of influence where we live and serve and work and play. We interact daily with neighbors and coworkers, and we believe that Jesus has placed us in these spheres to be witnesses of who he is. So whether we are accountants or teachers, whatever profession you may be, we are called to be missionaries with the heartbeat of discipleship. A disciple is one who follows, who learns from, and obeys someone who is greater than himself, seeking in everything to be like their master. Our desire is to make more disciples of Jesus. As disciples, we seek to follow Jesus, to learn to be like him, and obey what he is teaching us through his word. As disciple makers, we're calling others to follow Jesus, teaching them his word, exhorting them to obey the commands of Jesus and his commandments. And as we intentionally inject the gospel into everyday life, where we live and serve and work and play, we call those who do not know Jesus to follow him and those who claim to the name of Jesus to love and obey him. In every situation, we seek to help others find life and place and meaning in, in Christ. And this is not simply a mission to make converts, as if relationships were merely a means to an end, but rather a welcoming of others to experience true life in communion with God and his people. We believe that evangelism is merely the first step in disciple making and that helping walk someone into maturity with Jesus, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded should always be the natural next step. One cannot be separated from the other. And like I said, in each of these core values, these are only valuable if they're lived out and practiced. These have to be the driving force behind how our church operates, because without vision, 
it's hard to know what to say yes to and what to say no to. And so these four core values, Christ-centered, radical generosity, diverse family, and mission-driven are going to form the grid at, for us as a church moving forward, hopefully for the next several years as a church body, to know what good things that we say yes to and to know what good things that we are called to say no to. And after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus gathered his disciples together on, and he gave them some final instructions. In the church, we call this the Great Commission, and we can find it in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Here's what it says. It says, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Great Commission is the mission that Jesus gave to the church. Go and make disciples teaching them to observe everything I've commanded, but that command to go and make disciples. See, the challenge, I think, often is we're not sure what it means for us to be disciples of Jesus. And then, as a byproduct, we don't know what it means to make disciples of Jesus. And there are four, four components that we need to view life and ministry and what we do here and why we do it. And I, what I want to do is kind of give you the framework for how we think and why we do what we do. And then I want to specifically apply that to the context of Lost City. The four components are your understanding of what the kingdom is, what a disciple is, the role of society, and the role of church. How you understand this defines how you approach life and how you approach ministry. Many of us grew up in church settings. We've been to church our entire lives and actively been involved in church. Some of us have been in churches that your life was defined by what the church was doing. So you had three, four services a week. Your friends and relationships were all in the local church. Your identity was found in what local church you went to. And there was even a sense of pride to say that you were part of such and such a church. If you're like me, you grew up in the church framework where everything was about the local church. My role was in to help the local church become stronger, to build the church, to look better than the other churches in the city, to develop the ministries within the local church community. The primary framework for life was built with the church at the center. And in this framework where church is at the center, the lenses of kingdom and disciple and society and church, they look like this. The first word, kingdom. For the church framework, the gospel is the message of good news that enables people to join the church. And once you join the church, the gospel becomes elementary teachings and therefore is discarded and you're taught the deep things of God so that you, be, have, you, so that you would be full of information about God. So you learn memory verses and you will um, read the Bible consistently so that you can have more information about God. The gospel of salvation primarily has two interests. One, it wants to make sure that you are saved and a child of God. And then second, it wants to make sure you make it to heaven safely and securely. And this plays out in churches where the primary concern is making sure that we are a holy and separate people so that when the rapture happens and Jesus comes back, we're ready to go to heaven. The primary concern about this approach is ourselves and making sure we're doing everything possible to make sure that we're right with God, and then when Jesus returns, that we will see him face to face. That's the primary concern. That's kingdom. But the second word, disciple. In a church framework, a disciple is one who's able to learn theology properly. A disciple means someone who's a member of the local church, someone who participates in the local church. In this framework, those who are actively involved in the church, whether it's singing or teaching kids or holding a position, are elevated to places of authority and respect. And so you develop skills and talents and use your giftings primarily to bless the local church. Everything is centered on how you can help the church. The next word, society. For a church framework, how you view society is complex. You either view society as evil and you do your best to avoid society at all costs, 
or you're indifferent to society. And it plays no influence in, and you play no influence on in what's happening in the world around you. And because of that, you never get to know your neighbors. Your kids never get involved in activities. Your community doesn't know you exist because your primary concern is a local church and society is not where you're concerned with. If witnessing happens and you share the gospel with someone, a convert is immediately taken out of society, asked to lose all of their old friends and influences and become just like everyone else in the church. And because the church is disengaged from community, if the church ever moves or closes its door, the city would never know, the city would never care. And then the last word is the word church. In this framework, the local church is primarily about the building or the institution. Its concern is how we grow the church or build bigger buildings and monuments to reveal to the world how great we are and how we can protect our people from the influence of the world. And often what happens is that there's a fence or this invisible force shield uh, built around the local church. If you think about a fence, there are two primary purposes. First of all, a fence keeps things out, right? It keeps people out or animals out or um, outside dangers out, external dangers out. Unfortunately, many churches have become places where they're known for what they're against and have become places where people have felt unwelcome and unwanted. If there's a stain on your life, or if you have a past, or if you have had a moral failure, you're not welcome into the church. If you don't look like the rest of the folks in the building, you're not welcome there. If you're a maverick and want to do things that are outside of the sphere of what the church does, you're not welcome there. So one part of the fence is it keeps things out, but the fence plays another role. In our backyard, there's a fence. And um, when our kids were smaller, they had freedom to go and play in the backyard because we knew that as long as they stayed within the confines of the fence, they were safe. They, they were safe within the walls of those four fences. We made sure they didn't wander off into places that they shouldn't go. They didn't wander off into the street, into oncoming traffic. Unfortunately, a lot of churches have created fences with the purposes of keeping people within the four walls of their church. All the resources that the church spends is on their own members. Any event that they do is for their own people. They do a lot of activities, but it will be for themselves. They'll have lock-ins for themselves. They'll do everything possible to keep the church away from the world. They'll build gymnasiums so that their people can have a place to play. They'll create schools so that their kids will have a place to learn. They'll create food courts in their churches so that their people will have a place to eat. They'll create programs for themselves. They'll build buildings for themselves. And someone that's different or not part of their church is often unwelcome or ignored when they show up for these activities. And because Sunday mornings are the primary means of keeping people coming back, all of the resources and all of the energy are spent on making sure that each Sunday is unique and different and comfortable so that people will keep coming back over and over and over again. Now, listen, I'll be the first to admit that I grew up in a church with that mindset. The easiest thing to do was to be around people that behaved like you, thought like you, and was like you. The challenge has been that God mandates in his word, in the text that we read, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, of all people groups, people similar to us, people completely different from us. That's a church-centered mindset. But a kingdom-centered mindset approaches life and ministry completely differently. It's not consumed about what we do together as much as how we are being equipped so that we can go. Its primary concern is not comfort and self, but preparation to serve. Its motive is not to grow the biggest gathering, but to produce the greatest disciples. What does it mean to be kingdom-centered? How you view those four lenses changes drastically. Here's how. The first word, gospel. In the church-centered framework, the kingdom is what brings you, the gospel is what brings you into the church and guarantees that you have a better um, place in the afterlife. But in a kingdom-centered framework, we believe the gospel is not just a one-time event that happened in the past or an event that's going to happen in the future. 
We believe that Jesus' kingdom means that he's working right now. This means that Jesus is acting in the world right now. And the gospel plays in every facet of your life. The gospel isn't simply what brings you into the kingdom. It's what helps you strive in the kingdom. The trans gospel transforms how you look at your life, how you look at your marriage, how you look at your finances, your parenting, your job, your relationships, your lifestyle choices. Everything is centered on the gospel. Why? Because you're called to be salt and light in this world. When your life is transformed by the gospel, you want marriages that honor Jesus. You parent because you want to raise kids that love Jesus. You handle your money ethically because of Jesus. You respect the date that you're on a date with because you love Jesus. And you work faithfully because it honors Jesus. And friends, the world notices. Someone that lives out the gospel of the kingdom understands that because of sin, the world is broken. Because of sin, our own lives are broken. Because of sin, relationships are broken. And he or she understands that the gospel is not just a gospel of salvation, but it's also a gospel of reconciliation. It is part of restoring things to the way that God intended it to be. That means we're more than simply concerned about growing our church, but we're interested in getting involved where God is working. And so the question I got to ask is, where is God working in your life? Where has God placed you? It could be in a family down the street whose son is on drugs and the parents don't know what to do about it. It could be in the home that has been by, affected by the sins of an affair. It could be on the campus of UTD or Richland where students are trying to answer the simple questions of who am I? Why am I here? It could be at your workplace where your coworker is struggling and needs prayer. A kingdom-centered person understands that God is always working around them. He doesn't stop working in their lives the moment they leave their church building, but God is working in the lives of individuals in their schools and their families and their workplaces and has strategically placed you where you are so that you can be agents of reconciliation for the sake of the gospel. The gospel moves from being all about you to understanding that you are saved for a purpose so much bigger than God just simply blessing you, protecting you, providing for you so that you could die a happy um, you could die a happy old man or an old woman. You're saved for something so much bigger. That's kingdom. But the second word is disciple. In the church-centered model, a disciple is usually someone who attends church and does the activities of the church. They might not have any relationship with Jesus, might be living in sin all week, might only be in church out of obligation or family pressure, but because they're a member, they're considered a disciple. But in a kingdom mindset... A disciple is someone who's really following out the commands of Jesus. He or she is one that's trying to live for Jesus in every facet of life. And if we're going to see transformation and lives change for Jesus, friends, all of us have to be in the game. Each of you have incredible gifting and skills that can make a difference when mobilized for the good of others. In our community, we're blessed with people that have a wide range of gifts. There are people in our community that can teach. Others of you have incredible business skills. Some of you have great organizational skills. Some of you are incredibly creative. Others are musically talented. Each of us have been gifted by God. And you choose whether you bring, you use your gifts to bring glory to God or to make sure your life is taken care of. Discipleship is not just mere transfer of Bible knowledge so you could quote hundreds of Bible verses, but it's being able to apply the teachings of the Bible to everyday life. And, you know, if you think about the early church, you've got to understand that the church grew not because of institutions or programs or new improved buildings, but by something simple and organic. People that were in love with Jesus, and they were willing to obey him no matter what. Why was the early church successful? They didn't have seminaries. They didn't have books and Christian leaders like we do today. They didn't have television programs like we do today. They didn't have impressive websites or social media posts. They didn't have plush buildings. Most of the people in the early church couldn't read or even write. They weren't interested in merely getting information so that they could look good in front of other people. But they learned the word when the teachers taught it, and it radically changed the way they lived their lives. And friends, that's the biggest challenge that we face. If the word of God doesn't change the way we live our lives, then we're not a disciple of Jesus. 
We're just a mere consumer and simply want to be entertained. See, I think in our culture, we want to master information. We want to be able to have great arguments and debate people on all sorts of topics. We want to just master information. But the early church wasn't interested in mastering information. The early church wanted to be mastered by Jesus. And that changed the entire world. The next word is society. The third lens is society. In the church framework, society can be a bad thing. But in a kingdom mindset, society is a place where God has placed you. Some of you guys are in the medical field. And you have to understand that you're representatives of Jesus there. Some of you are in corporate America. And you're representatives of Jesus there. Others of you are college students and you're representatives of Jesus there. That means you get involved in your society and activities that are going on around you. It brings me joy to hear that people in our church are involved in things like homeowners association because what incredible opportunities to meet neighbors, build relationships. You get involved in your kids' schools and activities because relationships can be built that can have kingdom impact. You don't simply hang out with just other believers, but you become intentional of getting into groups so that relationships can be built. Friends, for us, society is not a bad thing. It isn't a place where we simply earn our kingdom or earn our income so then we can retreat back to the church on the weekends. It's a place where God has placed us so that we can be salt and light for Jesus exactly where God wants you to be. And then the last word is word church. In a church-centered model, everything goes back to the gathering of a people in a building called the church. And yet in a kingdom model, the church building is not the primary thing. It's understanding the church is not about a building, but it's a group of people that gathers together to worship Jesus and to be equipped to live life on mission for Jesus. That's the church. That means the building that we gather in is not the church. It's just the building. Before we were in there, it was an automotive repair shop. And then another ch church took it and converted it, and then we moved in. But this building is just simply an instrument where the church gathers on a weekly basis. The importance is not about the building or programs, but it's about the people that gather there. And friends, when you understand this, you understand that the building called a church building is not the primary agent that God uses to change our society, but it is we, you and I, the church, individuals full of the Holy Spirit that God uses. What we do on Sunday morning as a gathering is not the primary activity of the week. That hour that we spend together is merely to equip and encourage and empower you as you do the important thing of living out your faith in Jesus. Now listen, don't get me wrong. The gathering is incredibly important because it's in the gathering that you're equipped to live life out there. The truths that are taught on Sunday morning are to transform your life so that you can make the right choices in your daily living. But understand the gathering together of the church isn't the Great Commission. Jesus did not say, go into every city and build a church building. He said, go and make disciples. That means that the role of the church plays, that the role the church plays is crucial to the health of society. We're called to bless and influence our society for the greater good of honoring Jesus. We're called to help the poor, the needy, the outcast for the sake of the gospel. We're called to do mission trips for the sake of the gospel. We're called to impact children that don't know Jesus for the sake of the gospel. We're called to make a difference in our city that if God ever shuts the door of our church down, the city would know that something good was taken away. What does that look like for Lost City? Now, some of you are aware, most of you are aware, but the name LOFT is an acronym that stands for Living Our Faith Together. Living Our Faith Together. That's the community that we pray to Jesus for, the community that's living our faith together. In fact, that's the mission of our local church, a community that's living our faith together. You see it in the front wall every week when you walk into the sanctuary. It's not deep or profound, but it's who we are. We at Loft City, we're a community that is living our faith together. That's it. It's simple. Four words, and yet when you unpack those four words, you'll see that it's so much deeper than that. This isn't just our mission statement, but this is our dream, our hope of what we will be as a church. And these things I'm going to mention aren't only for our church, but I pray that these are for you individually as a follower of Jesus. 
for us to be the disciples that God has called us to be, there has to be certain rhythms that we have to incorporate into our lives. And these rhythms we've put under those four words, living our faith together. And let me highlight each of these words briefly and give you some rhythms and practices that we want to see each of us incorporate into our lives for Jesus. The first word in our mission statement is living. And that's defined as something that has life, that's active, that's thriving, that's growing, that's strong, that's flowing freely, a particular manner, a state or status of life. So at Loft, we believe that being a follower of Jesus or a Christian is much more than a mere label of identification. It's a manner of life, a pattern that's integrated into everyday life, not because we have to, but because we get to. Not so much out of religious compulsion, but compelled by a love for God and people. One that grasps that we are part of God's bigger story in redemptive history and are willing to give ourselves to the best that we can be in that story. One that believes our lives are bigger than fame and wealth and power, but it's one that's called to live on mission. One that understands that being a Christian doesn't mean that we do more in church and serve the church, but that we're called to be the church. Love is what a disciple of Jesus should be known for. And here's how we live it out. A couple of rhythms for you to consider. Number one, it means we're sent. Jesus sent us out on mission into culture to be salt and light everywhere we go. So that rhythm is we understand that we're missionaries everywhere we are. The second rhythm is we eat, that we choose not to waste our meals. We choose to commune with others whenever possible, and that we view every meal as a blessing from God. We realize that some of the most sacred moments happen over the sharing of a meal together as lives are open and shared and ministry happens. Friends, we see this modeled in the life of Jesus. Some of the greatest teachings that Jesus did in scripture was over a meal. Relationships were built over a meal. And so we, like our Savior, value eating together. It also means we're a presence in society. We don't believe we're called to create a subculture. Instead, we are called to dwell within culture in order to influence, shape, and redeem it for God. We believe that this whole world and everything in it and everyone in it belongs to God. And like Jesus, we choose to enter the story in order to change the story. It means we listen. We are charged to love God and our neighbors and ourselves. And one tangible expression of love is listening. That we'll take opportunities to hear the stories of others. To rejoice with those who are rejoicing to weep with those that are weeping. Not only do we listen to each other, but we also listen for God and create deliberate moments of silence and quiet our hearts before our creator. It means we party or celebrate. Things like barbecues, inviting friends to our home for meals, being involved in sports and activities that are fun and non-religious these are just examples of what it means to party. We choose to celebrate and enjoy life with people both inside and outside of our community. Why? Because this is what Jesus did. Remember, he was known as a friend of sinners and tax collectors. It means we bless. We're blessed by God to be a blessing to others. And this can come in various forms. I mean, encouraging email, a note of an appreciation, a kind word, a unselfish act, a helping hand, giving generously, wherever your imagination takes you, being a blessing means making deposits into the lives of other people. Showing grace is to do um, so whether someone deserves it or not. We look for ways to tangibly bless others. So that's living. The second word is the word our. And that word is a very simple yet complex term. It would be very easy for us to define our as people that look like us, behave like us, belong in the same socioeconomic class as us. And yet God defines our as the entire world. 
The gospel is not excluded to one person or one group. However, as a local church, we can put some clearer definition of what our looks like to us. Understand the word our, we practice two specific rhythms. The rhythms of compassion and including. Compassion. Matthew 9, Jesus states that when um, Matthew 9 states that when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. Jesus saw the crowd. He stepped into their story, spoke directly to them. He didn't just simply speak at them. Who are the faces that we're called to see? Some of these faces, we already know their stories. Some are faces that we care about. Some are exploring Jesus for the first time and looking for answers. Some are prodigals who have wandered away from the church. Some have suffered great heartache and pain due to broken relationships. Some are giving love one last shot. Some have no clue how they're going to pay their bills this week. Some will blow their excess on a shopping spree on things that they don't need. Some are drowning in confusion about their future. Some know full well where they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to do, but they don't have the courage to do it. Some have neglected those that they love. Some have been neglected by those that they love. Some are oblivious to their own self-righteousness. Some can only see their total depravity. Some are theological snobs who think they know it all. Some have never studied scripture at all. Some are recovering from their addictions. Some are denying that they have addiction. Some feel overwhelmed by life. Some feel like life is empty. Some desperately need the gospel. Some desperately need to be reminded of the gospel. And friend, friends, to these, we are called to be compassionate. It also means we include. We understand that the arm of God is big enough to wrap around the whole world. And the least that we can do is wrap around our arm around our neighbor, the people that we come in contact with daily. It means that we will not play favorites based on social status, but we view all people as equally valuable under the Almighty God. Our community is one where people can belong before they believe, and they will find grace overflowing from the people in our community. It means that all are welcome to the table, and it includes the college student community at UTD in Richland, it includes the young college graduates seeking for the pursuit of happiness. It includes families where both parents are there or where a single parent is working multiple jobs to provide for their children at home. It includes those of you who are empty nesters and your kids have left. We include. Living our. The next word is faith. Living our faith. And that word faith means of grace, truth, mission, meaning. Our styles and methods may not be typical, but Loft is all about, all for, and all because of Jesus. To him we give loyalty and allegiance. And because of that, we strive to be a church that embraces a biblical worldview wherever God places us in life. We believe in the timeless truths of scripture. We're not looking for new teachings or new doctrines or a new religion. We're not looking to simply memorize and get puffed up in scripture. We absolutely believe God's word, the Bible, is relevant to our lives. And since Jesus said it was all about him, we calibrate our lives around Jesus. We calibrate our lives around his word. We believe that his word is the supreme court and ultimate authority, and there is no person or teaching or philosophy that's above it. We figure that if God says that this is his very word to us, it should be a big deal to us. In the Bible, we discover the truth of the gospel. In it, we discover that in Jesus, we get what we don't deserve. We get Jesus and his ever-flowing, overflowing love and forgiveness. And because we don't get what we deserve, we're free to give that grace to others. And so what rhythms do we incorporate? Let me give you a few. It means we follow. Above all, we seek to know, love, and follow Jesus in our thoughts, our words, our actions. And every moment we look to Jesus as our great king and example. 
following Jesus is a series of next steps, one step after another, each resulting in God making us more like him, each resulting in us daily dying to ourselves. It means we explore. To love God with all our minds means that we are curious and filled with wonder at what God has revealed, in particular in his word. It means we regularly read the Bible. We learn what it means to live the lives we're meant to live, and we're shaped by the very words of God. We also discover more about our creator and his creation in all the realms of learning through story and wisdom and song and nature and imagination and so much more. And yet our highest authority is our divine conversation with Jesus through the reading of scripture. It means we pray. It means we grow. Growth is a natural byproduct of every healthy living thing. And that includes people. Since growth comes from God, we continually fix our eyes on Jesus. We search our hearts for any cheap substitutes of him. And we daily confess and repent of our sin and place them at the feet of Jesus. We will seek to live lives of health and wholeness, remembering there's one throne and one source of genuine growth. It means we pray. We'll be people that have constant conversation and communion with God. As we live our lives, we pray without ceasing according to God's will. It means we thank God. We worship God. We're honest with God. We confess our sins to God. We listen to God and we look for opportunities to pray to others. Our hope is to be the go-to people for prayer in the relational networks that God has placed us in. And it means we fight. We'll stand for those who can't stand for themselves and offer hope to the hopeless. We'll fight against injustice and stand with those who are being oppressed. It means we will fight guilt-based religion by our actions and by the gospel. We agree with scripture and believe that justice for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a never flowing stream. In serving others, we serve Jesus. We will never forget that our ultimate mission is to bring good news and to be good news for those around us. Living our faith, last word, together. Living our faith together. The dictionary defines together as in harmony, in accord, in contact with one another. Friends of Lost City, it is our firm belief that you're not called to live your faith alone, but in a sense of community. The early church did everything together. The church is more than people that just worship God together, but because of the finished work of Jesus, we have been adopted as sons and daughters of God. Christ is our elder brother, and we are surrounded by brothers and sisters on a consistent basis. It is God's desire that as a family, we would be willing to give our lives for each other. And so what does that mean? It means relationships. We get this from God. When he created humanity, he designed us for a relationship with him and with one another. It is the, in the fabric of our being. This is why God calls us to essentially love him and people. Our challenge is to love like God loved us. The church was never meant to be a bunch of people who sit on, sit on chairs, put on fake masks, and go through the motions of religion. Instead, we're called to be a family where no one stands alone. And because relationships are important, we seek less church activities, churchy activities, and more friendships with people despite where they are in their spiritual journey. It also means we share. That we will seek to share our time, our talent, our treasure with others. Generosity will flow out of the grace that God has given us. We are to be rich in good works, to be generous and share. We'll be an authentic community who shares one another's burdens. With a battle cry that there is no one that's going to stand alone. This is pleasing to God and a fingerprint of a true disciple. It also means we're transparent. A community that holds each other accountable, encourages each other, forgives each other. A community that's not isolated and grows stronger when they see authenticity and transparency in their midst. A place where we can feel honest without fear of rejection. And lastly, it means accountability. We will seek to hold each other accountable in living lives for God's glory. We're not going to be satisfied with mediocre faith. 
We're not going to be satisfied with letting you coast, but we'll encourage each other to pursue God in complete surrender. Friends, that's what it means for us to be mission driven. It means that we incorporate into our lives the rhythms of being sent, eating, being a presence in society, listening well, partying, and blessing. It means that we will strive to be people that have compassion and include. It means that we will push into our faith by practicing rhythms of following and exploring and growing and praying and fighting. And it means we work on relationships. It means we share. It means we're transparent. It means we hold each other accountable. When we do that, we are mission-driven. Friends, I'm excited about this core value just as much as I am about the other three. Because I, when we do this well, we will bring much glory to God. And people that don't know Jesus will encounter Jesus through the way we live our lives. And so we are inviting you and calling you to be people that are driven to be on mission for Jesus. To understand that you're not a church attender. You are a missionary for Jesus. And so, Love City, can I encourage you to live on mission for Jesus? And let's do this as we live our faith together.